Hey, Elsa. Is there a way to just turn that down a hair? I noticed when Steve was talking that I can hear. The webinar will be presented by Jake Cryer. Jake is one of Biomark's project managers and will be assisted by Gabe Derrick, another of our project managers, as well as Elsa McDonald behind the camera, our ringleader uh, of the webinar series. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. As you can see, we are out in a park in Boise with uh, reasonable air quality due to the, the fires burning here in the West Coast. And I think we felt that going outside would be a better way to demonstrate the capabilities and of the cord antenna, uh, cord antenna system. Um, during the webinar, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of the screen, and I'll communicate those to Jake as we go. And additionally, we'll stay on for a couple minutes after, the, after Jake is done uh, with his presentation, and we can answer any follow-up questions. Uh, that you may have. With that, thanks again, and I'll turn it over to Jake. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you everybody for joining us for another installment of the Biomark webinar series. Today, I'm going to be going through the IS-1001 cord antenna system with you. As Steve mentioned, my name is Jake. I'm one of the project managers here. My colleague and teammate, Gabe, Derek, will be helping me on the computer side of things. That way, I'm not trying to run back and forth too often. As Steve mentioned, our first installment outside. One thing I'd like to do is kind of take a minute to explain why we're out here and why it's beneficial to take a system like the IS-1001 cord to a park. So at Biomark, we're lucky enough to have a, a big city park really close to our office. And with systems like this, what can happen is deploying something sensitive like the IS-1001 cord into an office building, you're gonna pick up a lot of the emitted noise that's electromagnetic energy that could be coming from your lighting systems, the AC power that's running through the building. Um, another thing as well is loading effects. So if there are ferrous materials like rebar in the, in the building, especially in the concrete floors, it's going to drastically affect and potentially detune the antenna so that you won't get the optimal performance. So that's why what we do at Biomark is we come out with our systems like this. We test them in an open setting where we know that it is quiet there is no emitted noise. We have the potential to get it out on a clean battery source and test it so that way we know that it functions properly before you, the end user, gets the product. And that way we can ensure that you get the cleanest and most accurate data that you're after. With that in mind, let's go ahead and get into the system. So for some of you listening in today, maybe you've already purchased a cord antenna system and you're looking to maybe gain a couple of tips or insights and tricks as to how to better deploy your system or maybe an avenue that you didn't realize you could take in your study. Some of you out there may be thinking about buying one and so we'd like to help kind of lean you in the direction to make sure that you have all the information to best suit your needs for your study. The first item that you're going to get when you purchase one of our IS-1001 cords is the IS-1001 portable enclosure. So this is a weatherproof but not watertight enclosure that houses the IS-1001 and any accessory board that comes on it. For today's demonstration, we have a Bluetooth data logger. We'll go through that a little bit on how to do a quick setup guide. The other options, the most common, are the LED, which is just an LED indicator light board that goes right here in the opening. And what that will do is give you a light sequence that will determine, is your antenna tuned? Is it reading tags? and that it's just more of a run through visually of how the system is performing. Another option is our USB data logger. Now that gives you, the user, a great interface for an external memory source. So if you're doing a remote monitoring situation and you can't get communications remotely onto the system, what you can do is you use a USB data logger 
and that will write memory to the external file, go out in the field, eject the file, replace it with a fresh one, go back to the office, download your data, and you're good to go. Another thing with the IS-1001 portable enclosure is your power source. This option is AC and DC power. Now this is a nice feature. So some of you may have remote studies that are on DC only power, but I wouldn't count out the fact that maybe in the future you'll have the chance to use an AC power source that's readily available to you in a different setting. Maybe you're a bat customer and you're using it out in the field to, for uh, modified bat roosts, or you're gonna take it into an industrial setting where you have an AC outlet readily, readily available. For today's demonstration, we're gonna run it on clean DC power provided batteries by Biomark. Now let's get into the connection for the J box. So the J box is the junction point between the antenna and the reader itself. It comes with the exciter cable and the exciter cable has a back shell connector that will plug into the side of the enclosure. This J box is weather proof, but again, not waterproof. So this will be good for snow and rain conditions. However, it cannot be submerged. If you did need a submersible product, if you were doing a more in-stream aquatic application, we have one of those. It's called our Litz cord antenna, and it is completely submersible. And keep an eye out because we might have a webinar in the near future for that. This is something along with the IS-1001 enclosure that you are going to want to keep on shore. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that these two items are out of any potential high water event or flood, because if they get submerged, they will fail and you'll have to replace them. With this, what we wanna do is just make sure that our connection is tight. It seats in with a couple of pin placements, and then we wanna twist on until we feel a locking position. Give it a couple of twists, make sure that that's in there tight. One thing that you wanna avoid is any potential loose fitting here. So if you weren't to connect this properly, it will sit and arc and cause the antenna to detune. It may not tune at all, and your performance is going to be less than optimal. So as long as that is tight, we'll go back to the J box. Here at the J box, we have a couple of waterproof fittings. Again, they're not submersible, but they are good for inclement weather and snow, rain. So we're going to twist this on. Again, making sure that these fittings are tight. That's going to ensure a proper connection and function throughout the J-Box into the reader. The IS-1001 cord itself is the final piece, third piece of equipment that you're going to get. What I've done today is we've laid the antenna out in a standard configuration that we at Biomark recommend you start with. So obviously versatility is the name of the game for the IS-1001 cord. However, if you start out in something that is less than ideal, it may not tune. So again, get out, play with it, take it to the park, test it, see how it works. And again, start with a standard configuration that we recommend. We'll link a picture at the end of this presentation into the three standard uh, configurations that we recommend you use. One thing about this is that we know it's going to tune here because it's tried and true, it's tested. We've used it many times ourselves within our testing at Biomark. Again, customers have used this and had great success. Some of the customer applications that we've been involved with are bats, ground squirrels, snakes, and it goes on and on because this really is a versatile product that can help you in many ways with any study you have. From there, we can go ahead and power up the reader now. Again, as I mentioned, we're gonna use clean DC power. And just a side note with that, if you have the ability to get your system on batteries, those are always gonna give you clean DC power. The introduction of AC can and sometimes cause some problems and that's conducted noise onto the system. If you run into any of that when you use the AC setup, feel free to give us a call and we can help you troubleshoot through those. But batteries are the best to get a baseline of how your antenna system is performing. So that's what we're gonna do today. If you look at the board here inside the enclosure, as I turn it on, you'll see a light sequence and a beep. That beep means that a virtual test tag was run on the reader to the antenna 
And that shows that it is going to read tags properly because it is tuned. That light sequence is what's going to also give us a quick indication of whether or not it's tuned and whether or not it's performing properly. Now we'll go ahead and step in with Gabe and he'll share his screen so that we can give you a quick rundown of how to connect via Bluetooth to your BLE data logger. Once you open the terminal window, one of our terminal programs we're going to use today is BioStat. That'll give us some real-time detections and diagnostics. You'll go in. There's going to be a COM serial port. We're going to go ahead and click that. And we are connected. One of the ways that you can see that you are connected is down in the left-hand corner. It will say connected via serial Bluetooth. A quick way to see whether or not the window is connected is to give it a command. So for this, we'll do RFS, which is report full status. Now, one thing to know here, when you see that first report full status, it's going to just be the Bluetooth data logger itself. Now, we need to get into the IS-1001 in order to determine how the functionality of the antenna is. So what we do here is give it a CDC, Charlie Delta Charlie command. And what that does is it opens up a direct communication port through the Bluetooth data logger into the IS-1001. Now you'll see this graph pop up here. And what that means is that we are now talking to the reader itself. And we are looking at the FDXB signal or the noise level of the antenna as we continue. Another thing that we'll look at and Gabe will highlight with his mouse is the antenna current how many amps are we putting through the antenna, as well as the antenna capacitors. And the capacitors really tell us where is it at in the tune range. So Gabe, what are we at right now? So our capacitors are at 395, and what is our current? 5.6 amps. So this antenna is tuned, it's performing well, and it will read tags at a very good length. One thing I'd like to point out is what is the range you're going to see with those two numbers? So let's start with the antenna current. Depending on the IS-1001 reader you choose, 12 versus 24 volts, you're going to see a range of antenna current from 3 amps to 7 amps. And that's just going to depend on the situation as well. Is it loading on anything? Did you deploy a portion of this in the water? Uh, water does cause a loading effect, which will drop some of the current as well as the cap. So with that at 5 amps, that's a good antenna current right in the center. That's what we would expect in, an, in a deployed situation like this. Now, for the caps being at 390, that range is from 0 to 1,023. Now, what that means is that in that range, the antenna could tune at any of those numbers. We like it to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, I'm very happy with 400. That's going to be a good number for this to be deployed out in the field. We may be seeing this morning with the morning dew a little bit of a loading effect due to the moisture. As I mentioned, you could deploy a portion of this in the water. However, that water will cause a loading effect and drop those caps. One thing to point out for the customers who may already have one and have experienced a cap difference, what we can do is if you want to lower your caps, say they're too high. 1023 is the extreme high end. And we don't want to go beyond that or the antenna will detune. And at that point, it is unfunctional. Also, at zero, if there's a zero cap value, that means you have dropped out of the board and it cannot perform its job properly. What did the antenna tune at now, Gabe? Ninety-four. So as you can see, as you make these changes outward, it's going to drop your antenna capacitors. Inversely, as we bring it back together, I would imagine that was around 360. three ninety two. So we got right back to where we were at square one. So that is a relationship that we would like you, the customer, to understand, and it will help you tremendously as you move forward in deploying these in the field. It is an inverse relationship that the farther out you space the antenna, your caps will drop, and the closer you get, your capacitors will go up. And I will go back to the water example to explain that a little better. If you had a stream, a small stream,
that you wanted to deploy the end portion of the antenna because the IS-1001 antenna itself is waterproof for a, where the Superflex conduit is, we would come back here and to account for that loading effect, we would put the initial portion of the antenna as tightly together as we could. And depending on the severity of the load, you can zip tie those or electrical tape them together to keep them in that, that compact area. As we go, let's go ahead and check the caps again and see where they went. It went out of tune. So you can see we've gone a little too far. Again, a simple adjustment might just do it. So we've still got to go a little more. Two ninety two. So depending on the situation, again, the water will drop those caps. So you just have to play with that. How much of this do you need to choke down? Where do you need to go? So now let's go ahead and do an exercise where we're going to completely detune the antenna. That was actually reading a tag in my pocket. Now the antenna is completely out of tune. So it won't read. We've essentially dropped all the way out of the floor. Let's say you're a bat customer and you have a cave that you want to monitor. Well, one of the situations that you can use this for is actually forming around the cave entrance itself. So what we can do is we'll mock up on the ground and pretend that this cave is about, say, nine feet in diameter. So we want to make a loop that's going to cover that. What we'll do is bring the center back. Again, choking it down. It's reading the tag I have in my pocket. and roughly the diameter of what the cave would be. Again, you can play with that and understand that as you continue to move that around, you just have to account for what we call the surface area of the antenna. So if you have this large surface area, you need to get rid of it at the beginning. If you open that up, you've got to bring it back. So just kind of keep that in mind as you move forward in the trial and error and troubleshoot the antenna itself, that we keep that surface area the same now what we can do is pretend, let's say that we want to move this and monitor around a location. It's still picking up the tag. I might not have wanted to put that in my front pocket, but it shows the effectiveness of the antenna, so that's good. I would imagine that it is still tuned. What are our caps, Gabe? 815. So now we're starting to reach that upper threshold. So what we can do again, if you remember, is separate the antenna. Keeping a consistent separation is going to provide the optimal performance of this. And then it does not matter how you how you position it, what the deployment is. As long as it's within that same range the whole way through, it will perform per, it will perform very well. What did it end up going to? 282. 282. So obviously you can see they can be sensitive, um, especially as you start to bring them back together. But right here, it is again reading tags, so we can go ahead and give it a test. And it's reading tags. We can hear the beeper. I'm not sure if you guys are picking that up on your end. Now I'd like to discuss a little bit of what the antenna, how it performs, and what we're essentially creating here with the electromagnetic field. So why does it go out of tune, or why, does, why do the capacitors decrease as you get farther out? So essentially this antenna, each side of the coil is creating its own electromagnetic field. Think of it as a bubble or a cylinder around this portion of the coil. 
on the other side, that antenna is doing the same thing. When they're close together, those fields couple and create one field. That's why our capacitors are in a higher range when it's close together and the field is very dense. So think of those two fields here and they combine and create one dense field. As we move it out, those fields become separated farther. The, you will hit a point when playing with this that these two fields completely separate and then you only read on the one. So if you're after a very high detection efficiency, which would be a pass through situation, maybe you have bats flying in and out. Uh, maybe you have a cave where you've got you know, hairs, snowshoe hairs, something that's running through very fast. You would want to do this and couple that field so that it creates the most intense field possible. Now I touched on it a little bit and we can kind of go through and explain what is pass by and what is pass through orientation. So obviously pass by is if the antenna were on the ground and you're wanting to monitor the movement of an animal. Right here, the, the tag is reading in my hand as it is right now. So the tag is parallel to the ground. And that's gonna be good if you just need to know presence absence kind of movement. Now. Again, if you need that high detection efficiency and you need to make sure that that field is as strong as possible to capture these individuals going through at a higher rate, you would want to do pass through where the tag is perpendicular to the field. What that'll do is give it a higher chance to get through the field. And right now it's reading so fast that we can't decipher the difference in the beep. So it sounds like one long high pitched sound right now. Take it back out, back in. Go ahead and stretch it back one more time. Jake, what size tag were you using for that example? I am using an APT12, one of our, our newest tags, the highest performing, and that's what uh, we use in the field for all of our testing as well. Is that a full duplex or a half duplex tag? That is a full duplex tag. Thanks. Yep, thank you, Steve. Now I'd like to go into some of the more fun technical aspects of what you can do with one of these antennas. So we've seen where you have just a standard antenna layout. You have one antenna, one reader. You're just seeing more of a presence absence type study. The cool part of this is that now you can put more than one antenna together. Let's say for a hypothetical situation, you had two of these antennas and you wanted to monitor some sort of movement pattern. Say you are monitoring sea turtles on a beach and you want to see movement to and from the shoreline. So what we can do for you is we would take two IS-1000 ones, we would pair those together in a synchronization, and then we would put two cord antennas on those. The reason that we have to synchronize those is that the closer you get with the two antenna fields, they'll start to talk and interact back and forth. Generally about 30 feet with these and inside of that is where we would like to use a synchronization. So in that, in that situation, we would have one antenna laid out here. We would have a synchronized set of readers in an enclosure, and then we would put the second one there. And say the nesting ground was here and the ocean was there, you would get the movement pattern. And the way we would decipher that data is just off of the timestamp of the tag. So it was detected on this antenna here and that antenna two minutes later, and so we know where they are moving to. Another thing we've had customers use is a master controller setup. The master controller is very cool because you can multiplex these IS-1001s with the antenna, much like our in-stream applications with our HDPE antennas, so that we can get up to 12 of these IS-1001 cords onto one master controller. We would do it the same way we would with a normal node. It would be multiplexed off the master controller, and with the 25-foot length, you could put up to 12 and you're looking at upwards of 300 feet that you can monitor. A study that comes to mind is using ponds or pools uh, as they're monitoring amphibians going to and from these during certain parts of the season. Um, and so depending on the, surf, the area and the circumference of that pond, you may be able to wrap all the way around it. We would essentially daisy chain these antennas together, just like we do with our HDPE setups and we'll go through that with you if that's something that you have in mind. Again, we're always a phone call away and we can make sure that you guys get the best 
set up and system for your application. So we've gone through the ISO. Oh, one, yeah. one question. If you Go have ahead. it, if you're multiplexing with a master controller, how long does it take to sample all of the individual uh, IS 1001s? So that's going to be set up on about a 120 sec millisecond pace. So the antenna's on and just on to the next as it goes. So you're going to sample that within a couple of seconds if you had all 12. So it's not like the antenna is turned off. Um, it's really always reading, especially as a tag enters that field, the antenna and the reader will know to kind of listen. So it will perk up its ears and say, I sense a tag coming or some, some level of signal and it will stay on a little bit longer. And those are also settings that we can help you play with, with your IS-1001 and kind of square that away. If you had a situation where you needed to listen a little bit longer to make sure that you catch that tag. Um, but yeah, so in reality, it's just a matter of a couple of seconds to go through the whole system because it's on such a fast pace. So now to wrap it up with the system, we've talked about the cord. I'd like to one again, describe that it is waterproof, the antenna itself, because it is in a waterproof conduit. However, once you get to the junction box, that is not waterproof. It cannot be submerged. It is water resistant, so it can handle inclement weather, snow, rain, etc. The J box, that's where all the wiring connections are done. That's where you're going to want to make sure that your fittings are tight so that you're not arcing uh, and creating any sort of noise signal or less than ideal performance. The J-Box is not waterproof. It is water resistant. So inclement weather, snow, rain, etc. The exciter cable to the enclosure. The nine pin connector that we have, again, not waterproof. It is water resistant. The IS-1001 itself today's Bluetooth data logger. Another thing that I can point out as well is there's a nice open window here. If for any reason you needed to call us and have a question about your system, that's going to show you the serial number of your IS-1001. And what we can do is reference that to one of our travelers in the system, and we'll know exactly how it was tested, what were our testing notes in the process of fabrication. Um, and that enclosure is not the only one that we offer. We also offer, say, for example, back to our synced system, we could put a, a stainless steel job box with a couple of synced readers inside of it. We also have a larger setup. We have solar setup for power in remote locations. We can put remote communications on these depending on the distance away from the office. If you don't have the ability to get out there to download your data on a regular basis or to swap batteries on a regular basis. I'd like to also point out, I think I forgot in the beginning, for this AC power model, it's very convenient that this is simply tied in via an extension cord. And what we do to make sure that this system functions properly on AC power is we will use an isolated power supply, AC to DC. The IS-1001 runs on DC power. So we need to make sure that that power coming in is cleaned up via the power supply and it's regulated to the IS-1001. That way we don't have any problems where the AC might be dirty and conducting, you know, what we call noise or undecipherable electromagnetic signal onto the system. Uh, and then another thing is also we don't want it to have a burst in AC power and hit the overvoltage of the IS-1001 and shut your system down. Steve, was there any more questions on that? Yeah, uh, there's I have two questions. One is on um, data storage options. You showed a blue, the Bluetooth data logger. Is there um, another option for storage of data with the IS-1001? And then I have another question after that. So for data storage, the IS-1001 has its own internal memory that gives you a significant amount of tag and status report data to store. The Bluetooth data logger also has an internal memory, and then you will want to come out and download that data to your computer, obviously via Bluetooth. The USB data logger is going to give you that external file option where you can write that to a USB. It will automatically write. We will configure that in the fabrication shop to make sure that that's writing before it leaves our, our facility. Um, and then, like I said, you simply come out on a 
regular basis, eject that flash drive, download that to your computer, you know, rewrite it or put a new one in. So that external gives you an added benefit for more storage. Um, if you think, for example, you would run out of storage internally on the IS-1001 and also on the data logger, uh, the IS-1001 has a very big memory, so it's unlikely that you would run into that unless you were having uh, multiple detections a day, thousands. Um, another setting that we will use to not eat up storage is our unique delay. What the unique delay does is it ensures that one tag cannot sit in the field and be read continuously and eat up all that data. Uh, we can set that, you can set that, and we can guide you through it on a different time interval. Generally, we set that to a minute, um, and it can be set up to an hour or I believe even longer. That way you don't sit there and that same tag, if it's sitting on the antenna, is just eating up your data. Uh, I described the LED board. That has no memory internally, so you would then be relying on the IS-1001 itself. I hope that explains that up a little bit. Oh, hold on. Oh. Yeah. I was losing my connection. Um, so if you have an LED board, how would you connect to the IS-1001? And so, as a leading question, if you were to use a computer, is there an effect of having the laptop plugged into AC power while you're connected to the IS-1001 reader? So that is a great question. So I'll start with the connection when you have the LED board, uh, and we can visually see that. I hope it is a small micro USB connection in the IS-1001 board itself, right on the edge there, if we can zoom in far enough. So what that would be is a standard USB on your laptop end to the micro USB of the IS-1001 reader. That's how you would communicate to the IS-1001 and you would manually download your data through that. So that is an option. It's a great connection. It's fast, obviously, USB. So going to the idea of having a laptop connected to the reader and having AC power connected to that. That is something we've seen and we have troubleshot through ourselves. It is going to have an effect. What can happen is that that AC current is coming into your computer and essentially being transferred or what we call conducted onto the IS-1001 and then into the system. It would not be out of the ordinary to see a 70%, you know, 60, 70% noise level if you had an AC adapter plugged into your laptop that's also plugged in to communicate to the IS-1001. Uh, also, it will amplify that even farther if your laptop is sitting on the IS-1001. So you want to make sure that that computer is nowhere near the reader because it can have an effect as it's too close in proximity. That signal in that field is going to see each other. And then also that AC outlet. You would want to have some sort of isolation between the charger and the, of the laptop and then obviously the IS-1001. Um, I know in my experience, I've seen a laptop plugged into AC near the reader, and as soon as you unplug that, it will go from, say, 50, 60 percent signal noise down to five. Um, just because, like I said, what it does is it conducts that what we call dirty power onto the system through the laptop because it can't isolate it. So I hope that kind of explains that. I can go into more detail if you needed. Okay, um, and then a question on uh, read range or performance in the, the nine foot loop you showed for the cave monitoring, is there detectability throughout that nine foot loop? Um, so we can go ahead and, you know, the way I wanted to end this and we can get there a little sooner, uh, I wanted to play with some of the configurations again. So let's go ahead and the what we call our large lollipop for the system is essentially that nine foot loop. It is still currently reading the tag in my pocket. So I'll get the tag out. And again, I do not believe you all can hear the beep. So this is uh, this might not be quite nine feet. Um, so as we go, we're in pass by, so we're passing over. It's currently reading right here. Um, I'd like to take a quick note. 
and we can explain a little bit of what our mapping the field process is. So we would take a yardstick or some sort of measuring, measuring device and we would come to the antenna. Generally, we start on the antenna and where is it detecting the tag in what orientation in pass by right now. If it's tech, if it's detecting the tag over the antenna right here, I'd say that's about 24 inches, two feet or so. I don't have a yardstick with me today for this demonstration. So that's a good detection. As we go in, obviously, like I mentioned, that field is on its own here. It cannot couple through that distance for pass by. If we go in, we're in pass through orientation. We're still reading in the center of this. So we do get detection throughout the entire loop. It's just more of, is it pass by or pass through? If we go again, pass by where it's parallel to the ground, it's not reading right now. It is reading again in pass by or in pass through, I apologize. So if for our example, this was a, a cave for a bat entrance, you would get those detections because they're flying through the field. So there's a higher probability that they're going to be detected. Um, and that really just comes down to, again, the field density, like I explained. And we see greater read range and better detection efficiency and field density through pass-through orientation all the time. And that's where we've seen this used in caves, houses, bat roosts, um, also hibernacula for snakes as well. Uh, all sorts of various applications that customers have used. Okay, thank you. Yep. So now one thing I wanted to do is let's try to get, I'll back up just a step. So some of you may have a very interesting setup you know, a location that's really hard to detect. How are you gonna determine how to use the antenna? So maybe we'll walk through now. This is the fun part where you get to play with it. And why again, go out to a park, take a colleague with you because chances are, it's not just gonna be yourself out in the field deploying this or you know, monitoring it, giving it some maintenance. So we wanna make sure that everybody has the ability to understand this. So let's just take this, loop it again, What we'll do is we'll I will need Gabe's help with our caps to see if the antenna is in tune. It is 502. So 502, that's right in the center. That's a great place to have it. So in my idea for this demonstration was Let's say you have multiple areas that you want to monitor, and it's, again, more of a presence absence with this. You're not going to know the movement across this single antenna. That's where we would need multiple antennas, like I explained, the synchronization or the multiplexing of multiple antennas here. But let's say you had a nest here, you had another nest here, and you had one beyond. If at any point any of those individuals come out and travel across this antenna in any of its configuration, you're going to get those detections. So it's a great way to see you get triple the coverage essentially for one product. Uh, and you could also have a nest here. You could have one on the other side. And I'd like to also point out and make sure that everyone does understand that even close to the J box, it's still going to read and it's still going to read tags up to the connections. So you essentially have all of that 25 feet in the cable to detect any individual. And it is still reading the tag in my pocket. I would have liked to have put a portion of this in the water today, but given that it is starting to turn the season, it might be a little cold. Um, and it's harder to do this, obviously, with electronics next to the water. We have the IS-1001 cord. We have your J-Box and the IS-1001 portable enclosure. I've been very happy to help you guys out today. And if there are any questions, I would be more than happy to go through those. And the sky is the limit, and we will work through everything we can. And thank you.
Thanks, Jake. Well done. We're going to, um, we can stay on for a little bit longer if anybody has any questions. And also, um, I can show you where the information is available on our website for the standard cord antennas and our other products. If I can. Yeah, Steve, if you want to share that standard configuration page, if you can, it'd okay. be nice to talk about that as well. So here's our, our web page. And within our web page, if you go to the products section or products and then antennas and scroll down, and here's information on all of our antennas, but the, specifically the information on the small scale system or, core, or standard cord system that Jake presented today is here. And it shows you the different configurations that Jake spoke of. And these are the standard um, kind of the baseline configurations that we've identified to give some place a starting point or a, a safe place to go back to, as well as the, the different components of that system. Back to that. So we'll hang out here for a little bit longer. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to post them to the Q&A box. Um, and if not, thank you very much for attending and please feel free to give us a call if you have any questions. Jake, this seems to be more of a uh, durability question, but somebody asked, um, would it be okay if a vehicle runs over the cord? Um, Yes, we've seen it run over. So the Superflex, you want to make sure that you try to avoid that at all costs. Um, in our experience, we've seen in a catastrophic event, a boulder dropped on an antenna coil and it will it will sever that. Um, but this has been run over with a vehicle actually at the park before um, and it still has performed. Again, I would highly recommend that that not happen very frequently, but it should be fine and sustain that ability to be run over, you know, once or twice in its life. And then additionally, um, any recommend recommendations on protecting the antenna from chewing? Um, this person's application would be for uh, a captive prairie dog colony. So for chewing, we've seen some of those. Um, unfortunately, if they're gonna chew on it, they're gonna chew on it. Uh, some of the you know, normal measures that I've seen people take is, you know, maybe a spicy, a spice like paprika, um, hot sauce on the line. Actually, we've, I've talked to customers that have done that, um, but time and time again, we do see that an individual will get curious and they will chew through the, it, hopefully what they chew through is the Superflex conduit and they don't actually make it to the antenna itself. Um, but beyond that, without interfering with the actual signal of the antenna. So for example, sometimes in applications, we'll put our, our cables into flexible metal conduit to protect them. But in this case, if we were to put flexible metal conduit over the antenna, it wouldn't read because that metal would essentially load the antenna out and it would never tune. Um, so I hate to say, but aside from just some basic measures of keeping an eye out, uh, you know, maybe again, hot sauce or something, um, you know, maybe some, I don't, you know, obviously if you're monitoring, you don't want to put anything out that would deter or potentially kill the individual. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really kind of a bummer that they're going to chew on it. We've seen propane lines be chewed through as well. Uh, so it is, it will prevent them to a certain point. And like I said, hopefully they just chew through the Superflex and not through the actual antenna cable. Uh, Jake, there's another question about um, small mammals or snakes crossing over a, a wildlife crossing. What would you do when those are typically wider? Um, what would you do to monitor something as wide as 180 feet? Uh, so if I understand that question correctly, you want a hundred plus feet linear you're not looking at a span of multiple antennas in a corridor um, and i guess i can explain both sides of that so in a corridor we could set up again several of these antennas multiplexed together or a couple of pairs of sync readers and antennas and that would give you multiple detection points through say you know a football field type of style where you have a width a standard width that goes on for a, a long distance when we get into the aspect of a very long, you know, one single pass, that's where our Litz cord antenna would take over. Um, the maximum length we have for that is 80 feet. 
uh, and that will give you that distance. Um, and then what we could do is separate, kind of offset a couple of those antennas to overlap, um, but they can't be too close together because those antennas are quite sensitive. Like I said, keep your eyes out. We'll more than likely have a Litz cord webinar in the near future. That way we can explain the other cord application for you guys that are interested in the greater lengths um, as well as more aquatic applications. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just interject and um, we did that. We did an overpass in Windsor, Ontario, and that overpass was 330 feet wide. And we deployed a single uh, single antenna, two ant an antenna on each end of that overpass to monitor movement of snakes. Um, so there is with the Litz cord and and I guess not keep in mind, but it's important to note that that antenna has a detection range of about two inches over the antenna. So it's very, yes. very limited, but in the application where snakes uh, are, or your tag is passing in close proximity, in close proximity, you can sample a pretty wide uh, width with a single antenna. Yeah, yeah. and that's and good then, to point out, Steve. And um, I was aware of that say, I just didn't wanna bring that up because it is a very low read range. Um, but obviously, given that it is a snake application, they're not going to be jumping too far over it. Yeah, or or at all potentially. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then another question um, is uh, from Macy: Is the system compatible with with older tags, or will I need to re-tag animals that currently have biomark tags, uh, say tagged within the last five years? So that's a great question. And one thing that's nice about that is that this antenna system is run off of our IS-1001. And the IS-1001 is what will detect those older versions of tags. Um, we can turn on an HDX detection. So you can detect HDX tags um, or older FDX if you have. So no, you don't need to go out and re-tag individuals. This is a nice setup because you deploy it and it will not only capture that old generation technology, but it will also give you the ability to move forward and tag with the newer FDX, like I was using today, the APT12 um, or any of our tag products out there right now. So it's again, a really good product because you're not giving something up, you're just adding to your field study and you have the ability to detect along that entire range. Would you expect a difference in read range um, from the our current APT12 to say a tag that was available five or 10 years ago uh, of FDXB 134.2 kilohertz tag? So you might experience that with the APT. So the APT is our highest performing tag. So it's going to always have a little bit more read range. Um, but as long as it's still an FDX tag, you're going to you're going to see minimal difference. It might be a couple of inches, depending on what tag it is. You know, if it's an FDX 12 millimeter tag, it's still the same size as the APT. It's just a little different technology. Um, but realistically, that's only going to come in the form of about two inches, three inches or so. So you're not going to see a drastic difference. So that's a benefit as well to this system. Okay. Thank you. So it's not, um, so what about, I know we offer eight, nine, 10, 12, 23, 32 millimeter tags. What about the, if someone has a, a small snake or a, a frog um, and they need to use, or a, a snail, um, what about the use of eight and a half or nine millimeter tags? And will you still be able to detect them on this antenna? Oh, absolutely. And we have a chart that we can, uh, we don't have it available online at the moment, but we have done read range testing and mapped the field with all of our tag products. That way we know and we can give you an accurate estimation of what you should expect of the read range. Um, and I guess I wanna go back as well and explain to some of the customers who may not be getting their ideal read range, um, how we can kind of manipulate the antenna to get that. So if Elsa wants to show the antenna here, so if you have any of the tag products and you're expecting a higher read range than what you're getting, well, why is it not reading there? And you might want to call us and tell us that it's not working properly. But I, again, assure you that it is. So what we do is it comes back to that field concept. If your tag is not being read at a level that you think it should be, simply play with the orientation and the separation of that antenna. If you bring it closer together, 
you're going to get a denser field. You might get higher read range of an eight millimeter tag versus you know, a 12. Um, so just as an example, if we're too far out, you're that's reading again as I'm sitting here. An eight millimeter tag is not going to read very high on a single portion of the antenna. But as you bring it closer together and again, those fields couple that eight millimeter tag read range is going to go up. So that's how we want to determine what is the read range and how are you going to get the best read range for your tagging situation and the study you're after. Um, and it, it just comes down to playing with that coil and finding that sweet spot where the fields couple and they give you the highest field density and give you that detection of whatever style tag you have. Um, but realistically, you will always see lower detection ranges on the eight millimeter tags, nine, 10, and our highest on the 12 millimeter and up for the bigger tags. They can produce a little more energy in that field, and that's where that read range comes from. Okay. Um, and another question, is the APT12 tag programmable? I mean, can you program the ID, or can Biomart provide the customer of the list of tag codes that are within a vial or a tag of preloaded tray, a tray of preloaded tags? I will answer that as best as I can. Um, that may be a question more for one of our tag sales guys. From my understanding, we can provide you a vial range, but it would be up to you to get an individual tag code out of that using one of our handheld scanners and then to compile a list. Um, and it might end up coming down to you having to keep track of that tag code as you scan each individual tag out of a vial or a tray. I do not believe at this point, and I hope I don't you know, out, speak out of turn on this, but I don't believe we can provide individual tags for a vial or a tray. Yeah, that's correct. The APT-12 is not programmable, but we can provide a clip file that shows all the tag codes within a vial or a tray. Yes. Um, Thank you, Steve. You're, <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, is it possible, what about an electric fence? If you uh, you have cattle in your study area that are being, you know, contained by an electric fence, and you need to put that antenna in close proximity. So again, what it's going to come down to: a lot of these studies and a lot of the applications are really based on the field experience and how you troubleshoot through the process, um, which is why we also provide our services to come out and help you with that. With an electric fence, say for cattle in this instance, you're going to have to play with how close you can get to it. Are you parallel? Are you perpendicular? Um, you know, and that's where we have seen the ability to get closer to certain things that are creating that electromagnetic interference. Um, you know, if you're parallel, they're both reading separate, but they might start to couple as you get together. Um, again, it's it's to the same concept of why we can't put two of these antennas too close together without synchronizing them. Um, and then also, if you put it perpendicular in the field, you may miss that signal because the two are not interacting at all. It would really come down to playing with it in the field setting, seeing where your signal strength is you know, or where your signal is for the noise. Um, do you hit that electric fence and it just sends the antenna out of tune because you're too close does the current drop um, so really it would come down to a field setting and just troubleshooting trial and error through that but it is possible to get that out in a setting like that and just you know understand that there may be some drawbacks and some some hoops you have to jump through in order to make it function properly okay which yeah which is a which goes back to having these standard configurations and testing them, you know, in an open area away from your study site to develop confidence and establish a baseline. So then when you do go to your study site and you run into electric fences, you know, you know, what you should get versus what you are getting. Absolutely. Um, and just to, you know, expand on that a little further, when you take it out and you get that baseline of, okay, I know this works because I tested it in the park or the field behind my house or in my backyard, when you have that baseline, then take that baseline you know so well and use that configuration as you test in the field. And if you see that I get too close to that fence in the straight line configuration and it starts to go up in noise, well then just separate that straight line again a little farther until you see how close in proximity you can get 
Um, but yeah, like you said, Steve, it is great to have that baseline knowledge and have, you know, maybe it's your go-to configuration setting that you know a straight line is what you want to test everywhere you go, or it could be the lollipop or the double as well. Okay, and there's another question that I'll ask um, from John Nelson uh, in regard to older generation tags. And um, when we say older generation, it is older generation FDXB or 134.2 kilohertz tags. The IS-1001 reader does not decode 400 kilohertz or 125s. We have a, a handheld reader, the um, HPR Lite will decode those tags, but the IS-1001 is just 134.2 kilohertz FDXB and HDX tag technology. Correct. Well, it's um, nine o'clock. Uh, you bet, John. You're welcome. Um, if any, thank you, Jake. Uh, well done, Jake, Gabe, and Elsa. And if anybody has any questions, feel feel please feel free to contact us. And we'll also, as I mentioned earlier, the 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 webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website to view at a later date, view or share at our later later date. Thank you and be safe. Thank you, Steve.